But uh, today we're going to lean into the question, the thought, the mindset of what if we said yes? What if we said yes? Two of the, the most powerful, significant words that we have in our culture, in our world today, in the English language are two of the smallest. And they are this, yes and no, that makes such an impact on our daily life. How many of you remember the first time that you got that no and it said, will you go out with me? Check yes or no. <laughs> and in that moment, you had to make a life decision if you were going to make a commitment in the first grade, if you were going to be with that person and you had to say yes or no. And then you got one the day after from someone else and you're like, I'm going to say yes to both of them and see if I can get away with this. Or is that just me? Okay, maybe just me. I'm no, I know there's a few of you in here. Check yes or no. Or the, there's, there's the beautiful season of life when your kids learn to say yes and you're able to communicate a little bit with them and you hear, you hear yes, you want some yogurt? Yes. Do you want to go play outside? Yes. Do you have to go potty? Yes. Like what? And you're just like, I love it. And then there's No. And you're just like, did you forget how to say yes? Because it feels like all I'm hearing right now is no, no, no. And it's just a beautiful season of life. People talk about the terrible twos all the time. And I'm telling you threes, like, I'm sorry if you're about to have a three-year-old, but the threes are the, some of the most trying times you will ever experience with a toddler. There's so much emotion that stems from the word yes and the word no. Like we're in a season that we're stepping into in sports where the NFL is about to slide into the playoffs. The NBA just did their first in-season tournament. We're going into bowl season as the Razorbacks just missed out on another year. But there's so much emotion to, sorry, I just got to slide jabs in sometimes. Like, and OU won yesterday in basketball against the Razorbacks. So here we go. Just slide them in there. But we have these emotions that stem from the words yes and no. Like in, in these sports, you have an, a, an exciting moment and something happens and it's going good and it's your way. And you're like, yes, you're, you're enthusiastic about it. And there's something goes a different direction. And you're like, no, like, what are you doing? Why would you, why would you do that? It makes no sense at all. Why would you throw that flag? Why, like, you miss that. So much emotion. And then we have the seasons of life where there's so much disappointment and we look back and we're looking at our situation and we're like, God, no, no, like, like why? No, like this can't be happening. This can't be. At the same time, there are seasons where we look back at God. Yes, thank you. You are gracious and you are good. And just three letters and two letters and so much power in the both of them. There was a moment in, uh, in a few years ago, we were uh, playing basketball one night with a friend and we were, I mean, we were 26, 27. So, you know, we're educated by now. I got college degree and all that. And we're sitting there and my friend was texting his wife and he was talking about how he's about to come home. And he looks up at us and he goes, hey guys. I'm like, yeah. He's like, how do you spell yes? I'm like, huh? You are an educator, sir. Like you are teaching kids instrumental things in their life. And you're asking us, like, you ever have those moments in your life? You're like, I know it and I see it, but it just does not make sense. And that's what he was looking at in, in that word, yes. And he's like, how do you spell it? Like, why yes, you, dude, move on. Like, go, like, you got. But there are so many things in our life that we look at it and we wonder, is that the right fit? Is that what I believe? Is that what I see? And in this, this idea and this mindset today of what if we said yes, I want us to walk us through the steps of God's plan in our lives. It says this in Matthew chapter five, verse 37, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Some of the most resonating and instrumental impactful things in our lives. If we, if we would just let our yes be yes and our no be no and let our lives build in credibility, then people would look at us a little bit different. But yet so many times we give people what we call a dirty yes. And this is something that we've been walking through as a staff for the last several years in this idea of what a dirty yes is. And there's probably a lot of you that'll find yourself in these situations. And a dirty yes is simply this. It's when someone walks up to you and brings a request or asks you to do something or asks about a situation and you were just trying to remove yourself from it. And so you just know that all they want to hear is yes. And so you say, yes and you have no intention or no expectation of following through with that request. 
You probably didn't even actually hear what the actual request was. You just know if I say yes now, then they're going to move on. But when they come back, now you're lacking in credibility because you dropped the ball. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Some of you are like, if, if I just wish my husband would even acknowledge me if, if not yes or no, it doesn't matter. Just look at me when I ask of a request, please. So what if we said yes? I'm gonna walk through three parts of the Christmas nativity story today. And they're gonna be longer and they'll be on the screen, but I encourage you to follow along with it. Like just, just imagine you're sitting in a living room as I tell the stories and as I read them from the word of God today. And just listen to what's taking place in these moments and in these situations and in the lives of these people as they just say yes to what God wants to do in their life. So the first thing when it comes to what God's plan is for your life that I want you to catch today is that God's plan includes you. It includes you because you were created for a purpose and there's a call upon your life and you're not here by accident. Before you were even considered, before you were knit together in your mother's womb, God had a plan for your life. And so it says this in Luke chapter one, if you wanna turn there with me today in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the very first chapter of the book of Luke and, and Luke is a great storyteller as he walks through his side of the gospel story. In Luke chapter one, Luke wasn't a, a disciple. He's just telling his story of the experiences that he faced and that he saw. It says in Luke chapter one, verse 26 is where we'll start. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. I love how this angel sets this up as he walks in in his greeting to her. Oh, favored one, God's child, that you are chosen, you are specific, you are favored, you are anointed. The Lord is with you. It's evident to this moment that she spends time and she seeks God and she is available to his will because the angel just doesn't show up on accident. He looks at her and says, the Lord is with you. Verse 29 says, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Can you imagine just the feeling, the the, the joy, the excitement? Like if you have the confirmation of an angel, if he walked into your life and just said, you know what? You have the favor of God upon your life. Can I encourage you and tell you that you do? You are a child of God. You are chosen. You are set apart priesthood. God has a specific purpose for your life. So just like the angel is showing up and saying, you have the favor of God on your life. So do you. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is this in the sixth month with her who has been called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be me according to the word. And the angel departed from her. There's so much that we can gather through this of of Mary's availability to the call of God and God's plan for her life. We see that she, as a teenager, is available to what God wants to do. She has spent her whole life waiting listening, discerning, expecting a moment, being promised that the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world will return. But can you just put yourself in her shoes for a situation for a second? If you found yourself in this moment, do you really feel like her prayer for her life was, God, I know the Messiah is coming. I know the Savior of the world is on the way. Please let me be the one to carry him. I want to be the one that is responsible to be the mother of the savior of the world. 
Like, do you think that was her specific prayer? No, no, it, it likely was not. I mean, we don't know. It, it very well could have been, but I can say 99% in my mind that that was not the prayer that she prayed every single day. Now, did she pray to be available to what God wanted to do in her life? Most likely. From what we can see in this moment, most likely. But we probably don't have her saying, God, use me in this specific way. Because that can be a dangerous prayer to pray is God, use me in this specific way because that may not be the way that God wants to specifically use you. But she, in, in this moment, she's been praying, God, let me be available to what you want to do. Let me be available to your will in my life. Let me do what you call me to do. The plan that you have for my life, I want to step into that. And now there's a moment where this angel has showed up and said, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, you are going to carry him. So what she's been expecting her life, whole life is going to take place is now she's the one that is responsible for it. And so she's like, wait, what? Like, it, it is me? This doesn't make sense because I haven't been with a man. I'm going to be married, but now people are going to talk. People are going to say things like, why, why would you choose me? Some of you have walked through seasons of life where God has specifically called you into something. And our first response so many times is, God, why would you choose me? What, what do you see in me that is so uniquely different than somebody else? Why, like, I am missing, I am lacking, I am hurting, I am doubting. Why would you choose me to be a part of this? It's because God's plan includes you. Before you were even considered, thought about whatever took place for you to be on this earth today, God had a plan for you. And he's setting it in motion, but we have to be available to saying yes in this. So we see that the favor of God was upon Mary because she said yes to whatever he desired to do. He, she had spent time with him. She had sought after him. There's this little bit of doubt of a how can it be, but that little bit of doubt didn't last long because she knew God has a plan and he's a promise keeper. He's not just a promise maker, but he's a promise keeper. And I love what her response is at the end of this moment. And she looks at the angel and says, behold, I am a what? I am a servant of the Lord. So let it be me according to your word. And then the angel departed. Let me be a servant. Let me be a vessel. Let me do whatever your will is to be done in my life, God. That's what I want to see take place. And she is available and says yes in this moment. So she is in this part of the story. And there is a specific thing that God is calling you to be a part of and whatever your purpose and the plan that he has for you is. And you are specifically put in that part of the story for a specific reason. Jeremiah 29, 11 is the verse that people can throw out all the time. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans that are for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Feels good, looks good. I would, I would take that, I would run with it, encourage you with it every single day. But I would be missing if I didn't tell you right now, when you get home this evening or you dive into your word tomorrow morning, look at verses 12, 13, and 14. Because this, this is a promise, this is a declaration over your life, but there are action steps that take place, that need to take place for this to be evident in your life. Seek God. Let him guide you, let him lead you because his word says, if, I see, if you seek me, then I will find you. When you search for me, I will be there. And so yes, he has a plan for your life and he declares those things, but we must be available and sensitive to what God wants to do so that when he begins to speak to us, we can at least understand it a little bit. The proximity, the direction, the discernment. So God, is, is this of you? And not only will we be able to discern because it aligns with what his word says as we study it every single day, but I hope and pray that you would have people in your corner that are on the same track as you and same destination as you in life. So when you begin to speak to them about it, they can begin to encourage you and confirm things with you and for you in it rather than just shutting you down like the rest of the world tries to do because it does not make sense. The things that God asks us to do so often don't make sense because it says this in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. You see, we, 
sit in this seat and in this season, in this place, watching online or, or in the room today, and we look at the date of December 10th, 2023, and that's what we are thinking about. Some of us may be thinking about December 25th. Some of us may be thinking about what we're gonna do in 2024. But we don't always think so far out ahead and we are prisoners of the moment. If today, let me tell you this, that your life is gonna be defined one day by a mere two inches where God is looking at all of the past and all of the present and all of the future, our life is defined by about two inches. And that definition is the dash that comes between your birthday and your death date when you are buried. All of your life will fit in that window right there. And yet God is looking at all of it and how your dash fits in the aspect in the perspective of eternity. We don't think like he does. We don't see like he does, but yet he has called you for a specific time, just as Esther, for a specific time as this, to be around specific people, to have certain conversations that encourage and lead and direct their eternity. You get to be a part of that. But a lot of times we are the ones that dismiss God's call in our life because of our own self-deprecation. See, we're the ones that we diminish God's value on our life because we don't value ourselves in the way that is appropriate and true to what his word says. Well, I can't step into that. I can't be available to that. I can't say yes to that because I am lacking. I am short. I am a mistake. I hurt. I doubt. We, the list goes on and on and on. So we devalue God's creation in ourselves and we diminish the call on our lives because we aren't expectant and available to all that he has in store for us. And so we self-deprecate and we remove ourselves to all what his plan and his purpose is for our lives because we self-destruct. If we would just say yes, we could see all that God can do in our lives. So the, the, the plan isn't for us to just be in the starting point and just to say yes here. It is about the moments that follow. You have to say yes to start, but it's all about obedience and what takes place next. So Mary says yes, because she's already said yes to following God. And so that is the salvation moment, the experience that, hey, I am saying yes to following God, but following God and obedience to him isn't just about a moment in time. It's about moments that take place all the time. So your yes here and your yes there and your yes to follow and your yes that is next being available to all that God is going to do in the next season and the next one and the next one and the next one. Not just saying, God, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again and I punched my ticket to heaven and I'm gonna go. No, that's just the start. That is just the moment that we get in the game and we get to go and we can tell people of his goodness, his gracious, his glory, because he is the ultimate healer. He is the great physician. He is the love of all loves. He is, has the peace that surpasses all understanding. And we can put that evident in our lives and people begin to see that in us because we are available to what he wants to do in us. And so we say yes today so that we can say yes tomorrow and we can say yes next week and next year and be sensitive to how God is leading us and guiding us if we would just say yes to start because God's plan includes you. His plan includes you. You are not here by accident. You are not in this room by accident. You are not watching online by accident. God has something specific to you if you would be available and obedient to it. So as I, as I say, yes, what should I expect next? And again, I encourage you to go back and watch last year's Expect the Unexpected. But if I say yes now, how do I begin the process? What do I begin doing? What do I need to make sure that I have everything in line so that I am in the will of God, I am in the call of God? Let me tell you this, the second part of the story, the second connection that we can make to God's plan for your life is that it includes you, but a lot of the time, most of the time, it's not gonna make sense to us. And it's not gonna make sense to us because it, honestly, it doesn't have to make sense to us. Because again, we don't think the way that God thinks. He thinks so far beyond us. One of the favorite lyrics of a worship song is from a song called Here Now. And it says, faith makes a fool of what makes sense, but grace found my heart where logic ends. 
where justice called for all my debts, the friend of sinners came instead. And I love that line because so many times in life, like we look at things through such a logical perspective and it doesn't make sense. But God's saying, if you would just have faith and see where I can step in the middle of it, it doesn't have to make sense because I think beyond the way that you think. I make my own way. I part the seas. I I guide you through the wilderness. I take you where you need to go because I am the one that has the ultimate plan. I am the one that has set the purpose in your life. It doesn't have to make sense because you know what doesn't make sense is the fact that we deserve death and yet Jesus died for every single one of us. And after he died, he rose upon the, from the grave. And in that, that victory, that power, the authority that we get to experience. And so we see where Mary has said yes to the call of God on her life and to carry this child. But we also know that she has been committed to marriage and she's engaged to Joseph. And Joseph is a carpenter. So he's someone that's probably gonna think pretty logically The measurements have to line up. The cuts have to be right. Everything has to fit so that something else can fit on down the line in the project. And so when we lean into Matthew chapter one, we get this this moment where Joseph is being put into the process. And he's been thinking and he's been wondering that this does not make sense. And so in Matthew chapter one, in verse 18, we get to see kind of what he's feeling and what he's walking through as, as he's carrying this weight. As Mary's came in, she said, hey, I'm, I'm going to carry this baby. This baby is going to be the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He's going to be the savior of the world. And it's still not comprehending in his head what is actually taking place. Because in verse 18, we see this. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved, decided to divorce her quietly. He's already made up his mind. I'm not going to shame her. I'm not going to guilt her. There's already enough of that probably taking place. Both of our names are being drugged through the mud already. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm I'm just going to remove myself from this plan. I'm not going to put it on her, but I, I, I don't think I fit in this. It doesn't make sense. This isn't part of the plan. This isn't what we agreed to because they, there's this is an arranged marriage that is taking place. The families have agreed to it. They've agreed to it. They're stepping into it. They're teenagers stepping into the rest of their life. And he's looking at it and he's saying, but this isn't what I agreed to. And so he resolved to divorce her quietly. And the verse 20 says, but as he considered these things, so he's still thinking about it. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife for that which she has conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. So Joseph as well has spent his life growing up being told of the Messiah, the savior of the world that is going to come. But again, do you think that he really expected to be part of the equation in the process? Most likely not, because we don't think of ourselves being part of the equation of whatever process God has us in store. And so the angel declares this over them and he says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from the sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and he took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. And so he says, yes, even though it doesn't make sense, he says, yes. See, we have these situations so often in our, in our lives where we try and get it all together and we try and get everything lined up so that when we get it all lined up, then we can say yes to following God then we can do all God has called us to do because the finances are in order and the relationships are in check. And I apologize to that person and I handled all the things and I'm making better decisions now and I have better people in my life and I've learned how to make better choices. And we go through the checklist to get it right to say yes to Jesus without just saying yes to Jesus and submitting to him in the first place. He will provide in every atmosphere, in every way and equip you with everything you will ever need. 
he did it all throughout history and scripture. And he gives us example of example after example of influence. When he used someone like Esther to save the people, when he called someone like Moses out to, to, to free his people, when he took a shepherd boy and put him in the palace, and even after he was in the palace and he made mistake after mistake after mistake, he still used him in such a unique way. When he took three boys and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that just said yes to obeying God in such simple ways of, I will not bow down to the idol. I will eat what God has called us to eat. We will protect and take care of our bodies in a way to glorify him and did the simple things before in order so when the moment came into saying yes, they were ready and they were available. It doesn't always make sense. And to the rest of the world, what doesn't make sense is when we say yes to Jesus. So which side are we going to pick? Are we going to pick the side where it doesn't make sense to culture? Or are we going to pick the side where it just doesn't make sense to us? Because we know that God is not only just a promise maker, but he's a promise keeper. And he thinks in ways that are so different the way that, that we think. It says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We don't think like God thinks. But there's a beautiful thing that takes place when we begin to seek and follow God is when our thoughts become, become in alignment with his in order to know who God is, we have to spend time with God and seek after him because when we seek after him, then we come in alignment with his will and his purpose for us. And it's not wondering about God, are you gonna come through? It's God, you are going to come through. God, I am sitting in your will and I am sitting in your plan and I'm available to what you desire to do. One of the things I chuckle at so many times is when you're watching a, a, a game on TV and someone's coming back from injury and they're like, so-and-so is going to get to play today and he's coming in. He's probably about 85 or 90 percent. So he's, he can't go full speed, but he's good enough to get in the game. And that does not work with following God. You can't be 85 percent in because if you're 85 percent in, you're not in the full will of God. You are still holding on to something that you are keeping captive and holding on to and not trusting him with. Because if you are at 85%, you're still leaving 15% of his will out because his will is to have you completely and wholly to serve and to glorify him, to grow his kingdom, to downsize hell, to step into your full purpose. Because it's not just a plan that he holds. It is a purpose for your life. Amen. It says this in, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And this is the, the, one of the verses that is so instrumental to our lives and it's easy to say, but it's not always easy to follow through with. And it's trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And he, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. How many times do we look at the equation or we look at the thing in our life and we begin to navigate it and we begin to make sense of it all and we try and fix it and we lean on our, the way that we think, the way we function, the way that we operate, and we really try, we try our best to make it work. And then you look back on it six months later and you look at it and you say, uh, that did not work. I really made that a mess. I really, I really destroyed and hurt that relationship. I really put us in a, in a difficult situation financially. I find myself so far away from God because I just made two different decisions than I should make. And when it comes to being in alignment with God and trusting him, it, Paul says that you're being re, re, renewed in the way that you think, the way that you're thinking is being transformed in the renewing of your mind. And God does a beautiful thing of changing the way that we think so that we begin to learn to think like he thinks. We're not gonna get there, but we can begin to understand a little bit this the fact that God is greater and God is more and we don't have to have all the answers because he's the ultimate authority in it all. And so the only thing that we have to trust is we trust him. Because when we try and put the process in place when it's our own, it's probably not going to make sense. And it doesn't have to make sense. 
because we are vessels and we just work and we learn and we lean into the will of God on our lives. Just to be sensitive and available to where he wants to take us and what he wants to do. Okay, that's gonna be difficult for me though, Aaron, because I am a, I am a person that is logistics and processes and systems and I'm not the one that can just jump in and say, okay, you got it, I'm gonna go with it. Well, then the, the third part of this is gonna be even more difficult and that's okay because this is a process of walking with God step by step in learning his will. The Greek word is this, is gnosko, to intimately know. So it's not just to know who God is, but it's to know his character and to know his heart and not only to know him, but he know you as well. It's an intimate relationship. It's an intimate connection to know God's thoughts and for him to know yours. Because we can know about God but do we truly know God? And when we say yes to following him, we say yes to his plan, we see where we fit in it, and then we know it's probably not gonna make sense, and then it's really gonna shake up our lives because it's probably going to be inconvenient. And we live in a world that is all about convenience and comfort, and that's where we like to be. But God is not a God of convenience and comfort. He's a God of conviction and calling. And he wants us to step into things that we can never understand, never see, never acknowledge, never begin to process in these moments. And he's still calling, calling you to so much more. And it's likely going to be inconvenient. And so I want to lean into the last part of this as we look into to these stories. And it is in Luke chapter 2. Start in verse eight. It says, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. For unto you born is this day in the city of David is a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from, from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. See, these shepherds, they they were in a place that they were specifically stationed to be. They had a responsibility and it wasn't just that they were looking after some sheep that were out in the wilderness that were roaming and they were trying to make sure that they were all there like a normal farmer. These were a specific set of shepherds. They were just on the outside of town. The sheep that they were watching over were the ones of the temple that were to be kept perfect so that they would be ready for a sacrifice when Passover came. So again, these shepherds knew of the declaration of someone that would be coming one day. And they were responsible over something of significance, something that had value. That's what they were watching over. And yet when the angel appeared and said, hey, I need you to leave what you know. I need you to leave what you are responsible for because what you have been waiting on for years and years is here. And you are gonna be the first ones to go and tell about it. They looked at each other and they left what they were responsible for. They left what they had been trained up to watch over. They left what they were, they were noticing. And they went into the town to find the child of God. When they came back, did they still have a job? I don't know. But I do know in between, 
they did what God called them to do is they went and they told people about the fact that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords had came back. And that's what the, he had called them to. That's what the expectation was, is to be an evangelist, to go out and say, hey, the King of Kings is here. The Messiah has returned. And when he went and he told them this, it didn't make sense to the people. And you know what? A lot of times when you go out into the world that we live in today and you begin to talk about hope and you begin to talk about love and you begin to talk about relationship and you begin to talk about value, they're not going to understand it. When you begin to tell them about someone that loved them so much that they had never met, died on the cross for their sins, it's not gonna make sense to them. But yet we have been instructed and called to go out and to tell and to proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what they did in this season, because I can tell you this church, it could be easy for us and it is easy for us to sit here and to say, you know what, we are in Arkansas and there's a church on every corner. Everybody knows about Jesus, but I can tell you right now, not everybody knows about Jesus. We are in a time where it is imperative to tell people about who he is. People are searching People are wanting, they want something true and authentic and real, and they want to be set free from the things of this world, but they don't know where to go. You would think that people could just automatically say, you know what, something's missing, I'm gonna go to church, but that's not the world we live in anymore. They go every other place except here because they don't feel like they're gonna be accepted here. And so they search the world and they search the world and they search the world, yet we are called to go out and to proclaim the good news. And there are specific people that we are around that God is trusting us with telling. There's a lot of people that would tell you to go out and go and change the world. But you know what? You have a greater opportunity to do than changing the world is to go and change your world. Because I'll be straight with you, if you're gonna go out and change the world, you're not gonna do it. Because you're gonna miss some people. But you are there in order to change your world because when you begin to look to change your world and influence them, and then it overlaps with some other people, and then it overlaps with some other people, and there is a catalyst that takes place and it's called revival that transpires because you are sensitive and available and obedient to the call of God on your life of just saying yes and being part of the plan, knowing that sometimes it's not gonna make sense, and then just saying, you know what? I'm gonna get a little bit uncomfortable because I know he's the, the great comforter. And when I get uncomfortable, he's gonna put everything that I need behind me and for me so that I can fulfill the call of God on my life. He does not think the way that we think. It says this in Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You can have plans, that's great. Plans are good, but do your plans align with the purpose of God? because that is what is going to transpire and take place. His will would be done. He will never fail. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And you can have plan after plan after plan, but make sure it aligns with the purpose of God in your life. And how do you know the purpose of God in your life? You know that you are a part of it and you seek him daily. You know that it, sometimes it's not gonna make sense and you just have to trust him with the process. And there are gonna be times that it's gonna be inconvenient and you have to go out of your way and you have to do something different than you're comfortable with doing to make an eternal impact on somebody's life. It says this in Matthew 16, as I close this out. And then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone could come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What if we just said yes? What would your family, what would your workplace, what would your community look like if we just said yes? Mary sat there and she was like, I don't, I, I don't know, it, it, why me? Why me? Because you are a child of God. You are created in his image. You are taken from the same substance and character of who he is for a greater purpose than what the world says about you. Joseph said, it, it, does, it doesn't make sense. I don't wanna be a part of it if it doesn't make sense. And yet God stepped in the middle of it and said, no, it doesn't have to make sense because I'm in the middle of it and I will work th all things together for my good. I don't know, I don't know. I, if, 
I got to do something different than I'm used to doing. Okay, good. Do it different because I'm going to take you to different places and you got to trust me with that process. If we said yes, revival would take place day after day after day and people would be meeting Jesus. People would be declaring his name. His kingdom would grow. His glory would be known. The statistics would begin to, to decrease when it comes to suicide and depression. The statistics would begin to decrease as it comes to poverty and health. But it takes someone to say yes, to recognize that you are part of the plan because God has an ultimate purpose for your life. To know that you're gonna have to walk through the process and just trust in God, that he will make a way and you're gonna have to do some stuff a little bit different than you would expect to do. So with every head bowed and every eye closed in this room today, I'm gonna to dismiss us in prayer. But I just wanna pray for us as a church. As, to, as we go out of these doors today, as we click off online, to be available and obedient and just say yes. So Father, today we thank you. God, we praise you. God, because you are good, you are gracious, and again, you are holy. And you have the ultimate purpose for our lives and the lives of those that are around us. God, I pray today with whatever it is that we are facing, God, whatever it is that we are mulling over in our brain and in our heart that you are calling us to, God. God, that we just be available to you. God, we will be obedient to you. That we don't wait the process out because in the waiting and the delayed obedience is disobedience. God, I pray we be available to do what your work is calling us to do. God, that we be people that reflect you. God, that we represent you well, that when people see us as we walk in our communities, in our lives, and we walk into our home, they would see Jesus within us. God, I pray that we trust you through the ups and the downs. God, we celebrate you. We worship you in the highs and the lows. God, I'm grateful that we get to call this place home. God, that we get to be here together today. God, I thank you for the generosity of this church. God, I pray that in a moment like this, God, these gifts that are up here, God, that these lives will be impacted. God, there will be something significant that happens in their eternity because of the generosity of this house, that these people have no idea what impact they are going to make. God, for the moments that we, we experience every single day, God, that we just be available to what you are calling us to. God, that we step out of our comfort zone and we just trust you to give us the words because we've spent time with you that you would lead us and guide us in every situation. God, I thank you for these people. I thank you for our church. God, I thank you for all that you have in store, what, everything you've done this year. God, what you're continuing to doing through this season. God, and all that you're taking us into for the future. God, I pray we glorify you and honor you in all that we do. And we bring our best before you. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry.